Good morning, everybody. Last week of classes, and then you have exams not counting this class, so like exams in the other classes. So then, do you then have finals in that same class the week after that? Yeah, that's pretty typical, right? Uh, I changed a few years ago to make the exam on top of your final, right? So uh, hopefully a little bit less pressure during the exam week for you for this class. But uh, yeah, we're here. We've made it. Just got to finish up a few things. What I want to do is uh, tail end of chapter 14, a conceptual bit, and then um, we will dive into kind of a review, maybe build some toolboxes for these last three units here, and uh, get you up to the point where you can come on Wednesday and ask questions uh, about uh, what's going on. And fit, you know, patch up the holes in your understanding. So, let's. We've been doing Bernoulli's equation, right? The fluid dynamics equation. And what I want to do is uh, show you something that happens. <coughs> a conceptual thing that falls out of the equation. Like I said, it's, it's a little bit backwards from the way that I usually do stuff. And we're going to take a kind of a, just, we're going to simplify things here so that we can see what's going on easier. All right, so if we take, um, and we take any pipe, right, and it changes its size, but we keep the elevation the same so that we don't have to worry about changes in the um, pressure due to the height, then we can take a look at, say, say we're like, we'll call this side one and this side two. What's going to happen to the uh, fluid when it gets into the narrower channel? It speeds up, right? And we know that from the equation of continuity. All right, so it speeds up. And if I wanted to solve for the pressure difference, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going we're to compare the pressure over here with the pressure uh, in this part right here. So to do that, let's see. I'm going to let's, – let's say that our pressure difference, we want it to be P1 minus P2. Let's just say. So to get that, right, I need to move the P2 over there, and then I'm going to move this V1 over here, okay? <clears throat> so what do I get? I get 1 half rho V2 squared minus 1 half rho V1 squared. And so my pressure difference between the two sides, get rid of some of the, pull these constants out, V2 squared minus V1 squared. Okay, so we know that V2 is bigger than V1, right? So that means that everything on the right-hand side is positive. Whatever numbers you put in there, V2 is bigger than V1. It's going to have a positive number that represents the difference, pressure 1 and pressure 2. So P1 minus P2 is a positive number. What does that tell you about which pressure is bigger? Is P1 bigger or P2 bigger? P1 has to be bigger. Wait, wait, what? Hold on a second. If V2 is bigger than V1, which it is, then according to Bernoulli's equation, P1 has to be bigger than P2. In other words, if a fluid speeds up in a pipe because the pipe gets narrower, what happens to the pressure? decreases. Wait, what? <laughs> like, what? Wait, what? Bernoulli's principle states that the faster a fluid moves, the lower its internal pressure. Where the confusion comes from and, the, and the, the part of your brain that I am pushing against, where you're like, well, that's not true, Mr. Bale. If you turn the pressure up on a garden hose and you squirt it at me, it's going to feel – I'm going to feel the pressure. That pressure that you're feeling from the garden hose hitting you, that's a Chapter 9 momentum conservation or a Chapter 5 Newton's Third Law type interaction. Something is colliding with you. 
What Bernoulli's principle is talking about is the fluid inflow. Not as it impacts something, not as it interacts with anything, but as the fluid moves into a narrower channel and as it speeds up, the pressure, the internal pressure in that fluid will decrease. And so what I want to spend the next 10 minutes doing is proving that to you against your um, intuition and try to explain several different phenomena, including, but not limited to, $1,000 fines on the freeway, cold legs in the shower, airplane flight, levitation of spherical objects. What else did I forget? Um, oh, yeah. Vascular flutter. Here we go. For Dewey's principle, the faster a fluid moves, the lower its internal pressure. You can prove this one to yourself by just taking two pieces of paper. Do try this at home, okay? Take two pieces of paper, and what you want to do is you want to hold the piece of paper kind of like this, you know, straight up and down, but next to each other. You want to separate them by a couple centimeters or about an inch, okay? Just give, give them a little bit of separation. What I do is I, uh, is I stabilize with my thumbs, right? Okay, so I, I pinch them in my fingers, and then I stabilize with my thumbs. So I've got two vertical sheets of paper hanging next to each other with the long part of the paper pointing away from me. And then what, I, what you want to do is bring it up to your mouth and blow between them. Without moving your fingers. What happens to the sheets of paper as you blow between them? They squeeze together. Why do they squeeze together? Why is there more pressure on the outside? I lowered the pressure on the inside by speeding up the fluid between them. So the low pressure zone was on the inside, the high pressure zone was on the outside, and they came together. Bernoulli's principle states that the faster a fluid moves, the lower its internal pressure. All right. This has got to be one of the best home improvement tools ever, okay? And blowing leaves, that's boring, right, okay? Let me show you the proper way to use a leaf blower, okay? Leaf blower, right, air in the bottom. Oh, notice this one has a horizontally mounted fan, so the change in angular momentum isn't extreme. All right, and they also, it's kind of a small, cheap one. But anyway, even this small, cheapy job can get about 150 to 200 miles an hour Okay, of, of air coming out of the end here to push those pesky leaves around, whatever, right? Okay, that's not how you want to use it. Like a beach ball or any other fairly lightweight ball. It's going to be loud. I'll be able to talk during this. I'll just smile a lot. <laughs> Watch what happens. <laughs> Where's the fast moving fluid? All around it, right? As the air comes out of the blower, it has to go around the ball, right, in three dimensions. And so you have this fast moving fluid. So where's the low pressure? 
you've got this zone of fast moving fluid, so the low pressure is like all around the ball. The ball's sitting in a zone. Where's the high pressure? It, it's, it's everywhere else, right? Okay? And so the net sort of pressure is towards the center wherever the ball happens to be. And so the ball will stay in that zone of low pressure. As soon as it tries to wiggle out, you saw the beach ball, maybe kind of, it was kind of going back and forth. It would try to get out because the air is hitting it, right? It's trying to push it out of the airstream. But that lower pressure zone is keeping it. So it would try to go there to get pulled back. Inertia would carry it over, pull it back until it kind of stabilized. This one, we cheated a little bit. Um, definitely a physics ball because we've underinflated it. We underinflate it so that there's a little donut that forms here. And did you see how it started to spin and rotate in there? So we're spin stabilizing with angular momentum that way. That's a little trick. If you really want to impress the kids in the neighborhood, okay, this is how you do it. I am very popular neighborhood in the fall. Right? Okay, everybody else is blowing the leaves around. I'm just out there with balls in the front. Entertaining, entertaining kids, teaching them some physics. Um, so Bernoulli's principle, right? responsible for levitation of spherical objects, as long as they're not too heavy. You can actually, you take like an empty water bottle, you can actually levitate that. So usually a cylindrical object will have enough of a low pressure zone. It tumbles chaotically a little bit, so it can kind of spit itself out of the, out of the zone. But you can, you can levitate. Don't levitate your cat or your brother or sister or anything like that. We'll not be held responsible for what you stick in a fast moving screen of air. Um, Let's see, what else did I mention? Oh, 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 $1,000 fines on the uh, freeway, okay? Uh, what's the $1,000 fine on the freeway for? Littering, okay? So let's say that you, um, you it's, it's been a hard study session, right? You've been studying some physics, right? You've got the group together and everybody's like, oh, we need some food, right? And you're like, okay, well, I'll make a run to In-N-Out Burger, right? You take everybody's orders, take everybody's money, right? And you go down to In-N-Out Burger and you, you get the, right, they give it to you, right? And you put it in your car. It's sitting on the front seat as you're driving back to wherever it is the group is, right? And as you're driving along, right, there's always like one or two french fries that are kind of sticking out of the, right? And nobody would notice if you just had one, right? And you deserve it because you're your gas money, right? Okay, you're doing a service right back, right? And once you have one French fry, right? And before you know it, right? You've gone through all the French fries, three of the burgers, right? You've broken out in that sweat that just can only come from eating that much food that much fast, right? Okay, and you're driving along, right? And of course, at any hamburger place, even in and out. You get like, you know, a quarter pound of meat and they give you three pounds of paper. And, um, and so you've got, it, it, your, the inside of your car is just a mess of, you know, wrappers and things like that. And you have to roll down the window because, man, you're just sweaty and hot. Or you roll down the window. Nobody rolls down the window anymore. You roll down the window, right? And all of a sudden, where does all the paper go? Whoop. Right? Right out of the window. All the loose objects in the car. Whoop. Right? Okay? Have you ever experienced sort of that suction? Right? Maybe you've rolled down the window and you kind of put your hand there. We won't talk about how many of us do the, right, in the airstream, right? But like, there's some different pieces of dogs like to put, put their heads in the airstream. It's, why? Where's the low pressure zone? On the outside? Wait a second. Is it the air that's moving fast or is it the vehicle that's moving fast? Yes. <laughs> doesn't matter to the physics, okay? Your vehicle moving fast through not moving air would be effectively the same as your, if you're driving 55 miles an hour, then what is the air speed? 55 miles an hour, right? Like, unless you're driving into a headwind or a tailwind, right? Assuming the air is just sitting there, right? So if you're going 75, you're driving hurricane force winds, right? So, that airspeed outside of the window is where the low pressure zone is. High pressure zone is inside your car where the fluid is relatively static with respect to you. And so, whoop, there goes $1,000 if the CHP happens to see you. What else did I mention? Uh, oh, vascular flutter. Anybody? Vascular flutter, everybody know what that is? This is what happens when you have too many in and out burgers. 
and french fries. Uh, what happens when you eat uh, kind of greasy, high cholesterol food? Heart problems. Yeah, heart problems. But specifically what? What are you doing with your arteries? You're clogging them up, okay, with cholesterol and other fatty lipids, right? And on the walls of your arteries, and arteries are like big elastic tubes. They actually kind of stretch quite a bit. It's pretty amazing. But over time, okay, this hasn't really happened to you you're too young. Over time, okay, you'll have this buildup of, of what they're called plaque, okay? So if you've ever been to the sort of, you know, you got plaque buildup on your teeth or something like that, it's very similar stuff. Okay? And it builds up on the walls of your artery, and eventually it'll build up so much that the artery will, will narrow, right? And the blood trying to flow through here. So, so what happens to the blood as it approaches this constriction? What does it have to do? It has to speed up, right? So it speeds up through the constriction, and what happens to the pressure in here? It decreases. Now, the artery being an elastic pipe, a stretchy pipe, something that can bend, right, and change its shape, this will close off to such a degree and the, the blood will be moving so fast through that artery that all of a sudden the walls of the artery will touch. Like the pressure will lower and the artery will come together and the, all the plaque buildup and everything will touch and it will close the artery. It will just shut it down. And then, now that the artery is shut down, fluid flow stops in here. A bunch of pressure is building up on this side because your heart's trying to do its darndest to get the blood out to your extremities, right? And, and it will rebound, right? There'll be this big push, the, the, the fluid flow will stop, and so the pressure will go back to normal, and it'll kind of pop open. And as it pops open, all of this pressure buildup will go boom, right? And as soon as it starts moving fast through that opening, what happens? Pressure drops. And slams back together, pressure build, boom, 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 boom. That flutter can be measured like 20, 10, 10 to 30 times per second. Like you can hear it, like a doctor can hear it with a stethoscope if it's bad enough. Definitely on an ultrasound, but, but sometimes they just put it right on there, right? And they can hear your, your artery going, okay? inside there because of all this. So, so yeah, eat healthy. Right? But vascular flutter brought to you by Bernoulli's principle. Um, airplane flight? My wife doesn't like to fly in airplanes with me anywhere because I get way too excited about what's going on. Um, so let's see here. Uh, this, is, this is an airplane. That's the front end. Okay, right? And an airplane's wing, pretty interesting, the cross section kind of looks like that. So airplane, right, okay? It's got landing gear somewhere. Okay, right? So the wing looks like, this is the important part, okay? The upper part of the wing is basically bigger than the lower part of the wing. The lower part of the wing is generally kind of flat, and the upper part of the wing has this curve shape to it. The reason they want the curve shape there is that as the, you know, and, and, and human beings fly. We don't fly by flopping our wing. That doesn't work for us, okay? We fly by going fast, okay? The faster we move through the fluid, the more lift an airplane's wing generates. And uh, this is an oversimplification because there's a lot of really cool fluid dynamics and a lot of interesting physics going on here. So take this with a grain of salt. But the lift that's produced by the airplane wing is derived by the split in the airflow as it goes over the top and bottom of the wing. That airflow, in order to stay smooth and even and not turbulent and not let the plane fall out of the sky, needs to come back together, right, at the same place at the same time. So the bottom airstream is traveling a shorter distance than the upper airstream. The upper airstream has a further path to go in the same amount of time. So what happens to the speed of the airstream over the top? It speeds up. So where's the low pressure? The low pressure is on top where the fast moving air is. Where's the high pressure? It's on the bottom. What direction is the net pressure? It's up. And since pressure and force and area all come together, the wings have a surface area. So that means the net force will be up as well. And the faster you go, the more lifting force that you get. How does a plane land? 
it slows down, decreasing the amount of lift on the wings to counteract its weight. Right? So whenever I'm flying an airplane, always the window seat, okay? always near the wing, not the exit row. I, I don't care about getting out. It's, it's to be able to watch all of the amazing physics that's going on outside there, right? So I'm sitting there, my nose smashed against it, like, ah, oh, look at it, right? The poor person next to me is like getting hit all the time. Hey, look, look, Bernoulli's principle is about to happen. Watch it. Hydraulics. Did you see the hydraulics working? It's terrible. And I have like a captive audience for the first 20 minutes because the fast and seat don't sign up. They can't get away from the physics lecture. All right. Uh, what was the. Oh, 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 yeah. Cold legs in the shower. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are people that take showers in the morning and people that take showers in the evening. And we're not going to get into judgments over which is correct. But let's just assume right now that you are a morning shower type of person, okay? And so I imagine that uh, in your zombie state, right, that state of waking up and before you get into the shower, um, not all is, is, is clicking, right? Things, things are definitely not working the way that they're supposed to. And um, you, you probably have some method, right? You get into the shower, you close the shower curtain, and you have some, some way of like turning on the water and not getting hit by the water. Has it occurred to you that you can turn it on before getting in? Again, your mental state is not good early in the morning, right? Okay, right? So, you, right? And you're in the shower, right? You close the shower curtain, and, and you're, you're finally just kind of starting to warm up, and your lizard brain is going, oh, warm, it's okay, you can start working now. When all of a sudden, the cold, clammy hand of death reaches out and grabs you in the wake, right? And it is cold, and it is the shower curtain has attacked. You ever notice this? How the shower curtain just comes in and invades your personal space in a shower? What the heck? What's going on? Where's the fast moving fluid? It's inside the shower, right? You got all of this water flowing out of the shower head. It's pulling the air around, the other fluid around with it, right? And so the, <laughs> the pressure drops inside of the shower stall. And if your shower curtain like is very carefully closed up, right, on the edge, not letting water up, it's going to migrate in. It's going to kind of bubble in in sort of the middle. And if you're not careful, right, you're going to hit that cold wet shower curtain. And the high pressure is outside, lower pressure is inside. That's why when I became a homeowner, all my showers got doors on them. And I didn't want to hear screaming in the morning from people. It's the shower curtain attack. And um, hotels fix this. They don't want to have people screaming, well, ever, but especially in the morning. And um, so uh, what, what, what they do in hotels, if this is like the bathtub, right? So cross-section of the bathtub. Um, a very crooked bathtub. There we go. Okay. What they'll do, so if the shower curtain is like hanging vertically, right? Then that, that net force is horizontal and the weight of the shower curtain is vertical. Okay. So that shower curtain will bow in. What they do is instead of setting the rod like kind of directly above the tub, they'll move the rod out into the room and uh, so that the shower curtain hangs kind of, I, I've, very, I've exaggerated the angle here, right? But it, the shower curtain is hanging at sort of this angle and you'll see it. It, it. They won't like actually put it out in the room. What they'll do is they'll like, it'll bow outwards, okay? So it's kind of close to the shower at the ends, but then kind of bows outwards. And in so doing, what they've done is, right? The weight is now still pulling vertically but now there's something, right, to kind of act against that horizontal pull from Bernoulli's. And they give you the illusion that you actually have a bigger shower, when in fact, it's all showers everywhere are the same standard size, because tub sizes are standardized in the United States. But they, they overcome Bernoulli's principle right there by being clever with the angle that they hang the shower curtain. <clears throat> there's a lot of places where Bernoulli's principle um, comes into play cause things to happen. And if you know what to look for, you can, you can really, you can kind of see it everywhere. All right. I'm done lecturing. Good luck on the test. I'll see you on Thursday. Still here with you all the way to the end. Let's, but you can say, breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not going to give you any new information, right? Okay. <laughs> 
I won't be giving you any new information in the fall either, because as most of you know, I'm teaching physics two, right? Not the physics four series. But I will be around to give you new information if you want. Okay. Just need to come to that. But Dr. Kerfoot and uh, Mr. Trolley will do all, of, or uh, Mr. Ragdale will do all of the new information for you. You'll be in good hands. All right. We need to look at, I'll bring it up here in a second. Enough all the incriminating evidence. There we go. All right. Uh, oh, uh, so quizzes. I um, I went through this morning and I uh, went ahead and gave zeros to everybody that hasn't turned in your quiz sheets yet. So, but but don't panic. That was an incentive, right? That zero is probably weighing heavily on your score right now, right? That's an incentive for you to get your quiz sheets turned in. Um, and please do so after class, right? As soon as I get those in, I will you know, update your score and uh, everything will be just fine. You have until Friday. The syllabus says I don't take anything after this week. So every problem on your homework that needs fixing or a lab that maybe you haven't turned in, uh, a, a score that I didn't, you've got the paper, but I didn't put it in the grade up. All of these things need to be corrected by Friday. During finals week, the only thing that I will accept from you is your exam autopsy. Okay? So please, make sure you get everything in as soon as possible. Don't wait till Friday to get all of that done. All right, we have these topics right here. And uh, these are in alphabetical order, but let's, let's take a look at these in terms of the chapters that they came from. Archimedes Principle, where'd that come from? That was, uh, that was chapter 14, wasn't it? Bernoulli, conservation of energy, gravitational potential energy. It says chapter 13 right in the title, so that was, it was easy. Equation of continuity, also 14. Equilibrium, 12. Equilibrium, oh my gosh, 12. Orbits, 13. And then 13 and then 14. So let's let's see. That's that's uh, that's four from 14, four from 12, and four from why well, that was an even split across all of them, wasn't it? You guys have no hope. No. All right. All right. Um, notice. I mean, chapter 12 equilibrium. Well, duh. <laughs> right. Okay. So. I'm saying that you have two equilibrium problems. You want to take a guess as to what one of them is? A ladder-ish, something that does this, right? Okay. And what do you think the other one is? <laughs> right? Okay. What? Will the ladder have depth? What do you mean? <laughs> like on the homework where it's got two sides? No, no, no. Oh, oh, like that, the box. No, not the box. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was just cruel and unusual. That was a, a preview for all you civil engineers. Um, but yeah, no, you know, sticking to core of the homework, that kind of stuff. Uh, all right. And then there's two equilibrium conceptual questions. What possible things could I ask about conceptually with equilibrium? Is it equal? I mean, equilibrium just says that some of the forces is zero, some of the torques is zero. So be prepared for me to give you some pictures. Is this object in equilibrium? Like, if I give you a free body diagram, I ask you, is it in equilibrium? Yes or no. And if not, fix it, <laughs> right? Or um, here's five things, right? Which of these things has zero torque on it? zero forces on it. I, you had something somewhat similar on the last exam that kind of hinted at this. It was more about what's zero torque or which one has the most torque or whatever on it, right? But can you, looking at a free body diagram, either figure out what's wrong with it or which of the ones is actually in equilibrium, right? So that's a, these, these, are, these, are these are designed to test your ability, right, in that visual space. Um, 
to identify whether or not the forces and the torques indeed add up to zero. Uh, okay, so that was chapter 12. Chapter 13, so we got three orbit questions and one conservation of energy. So I decided to kind of, I could have just said, you know, four from chapter 13. Um, when it comes to orbital mechanics, right, we're assuming circular orbits and circular motion, and they're parts of that toolbox where the equations only apply to something that's in an orbit. And then there's parts of the toolbox that apply in orbit or really anywhere else. It doesn't have to be in orbit. So three of your questions are oriented towards orbit, so that really kind of helps you to sort of narrow it down. And then one of the questions is more of a um, straight-up conservation of energy, like uh, didn't you had some words, it was in the homework where you launched something, right? How high did it get? That was a conservation of energy one. Uh, was it an asteroid or meteor or something started from infinitely far away? How fast was it going or something like that? Those are all sort of straight up conservation of energy uh, questions that involve objects that aren't in orbit. Right? Um, and so when it comes to conceptual orbit stuff, what's like the key master, who was the guy that gave us really all the concepts behind orbits? It was Kepler and Kepler's laws. I mean, Newton came along, but he, he used Kepler's laws to prove that his universal law of gravitation was right. So in Kepler's laws, we have those statements, right? Number one, that the planets really do orbit as ellipses. And you, you do need to know about elliptical orbits, not mathematically. The math we do is always circular. But in terms of concept, right, you need to understand that elliptical orbits happen. And Kepler's second law, where do objects move the quickest in their elliptical orbits? Closest to the thing they are orbiting, right? An ellipse presupposes that there's going to be a closest point and a furthest point. And so objects are moving fastest at their closest distance to the thing they're orbiting. So a planet around a star moves fastest at its closest approach, right? Its orbital velocity is higher there. And again, Kepler's second law was a, a different way of talking about conservation of energy before energy was even a concept. Uh, all right, and then chapter four, so you got two questions on sort of conceptual orbital things. Other things that we talked about, uh, there was a um, special orbit we talked about, the geostationary or geosynchronous orbit. We're using those two terms interchangeably in this class. They are slightly different, don't, but don't worry about the difference. Um, so what, what's like kind of key feature of a geostationary satellite? It rotates, its orbital period is exactly one day, 24 hours, right? And so that means that from our point of view, the, the satellite is in like the same part of the sky, right? Okay, so uh, it can ask you about geosynchronous satellites, can ask you um, about um, uh, how many forces are acting on a satellite when it's in orbit? Assuming it's not firing its thrusters. It's really one. You, good job. You guys have started ignoring things like the sun and the moon and everything else that's in the universe, right? The chief force that's acting on anything in orbit is gravity, right? Which way does gravity point? Towards the center, right? So that means that orbit is free fall, isn't it? It just happens to be not getting any closer. All right, and then in chapter 14, fresh in our minds. No, it was last week, Mr. Bailey, I can't remember anything. Um, con conceptual Archimedes principle. Archimedes principle was all about buoyancy, right? So being able to ask you questions uh, about things that are floating. There, there's a lot of fertile ground there, right? Uh, from free body diagrams to what happens if you, um, like, like what happens uh, if a boat is loaded with a bunch of stuff and you start throwing that stuff out of the boat into the water? Like what happens to what the boat's doing? It rises, right? Okay, it means it displaces less water. Okay, so big thing, you know, being able to work your way through a, through a conceptual buoyancy problem. Uh, Bernoulli's equation, 
straight up, we've been doing that. And um, if you don't know what the answer is, guess square root of two gh. Probably. Uh, and then equation of continuity. You know what happens when a fluid goes through a narrow or you know or, or goes into a place where it gets bigger, speeds up, slows down, that kind of stuff. So that's the sort of the general overview. Should we uh, should we tackle toolboxes and maybe things you want to put on your cheat sheets? Okay, again, this is all very individual. Your brain works differently than mine and works differently from other people. Uh, this is generally why um, borrowing somebody else's cheat sheet doesn't often work. <laughs> okay. But let's, uh, let's see if there's anything in the chapter 12 portion of our cheat sheet that we could write down, right? Now, unfortunately, there's really only two equations. <laughs> this, is a, this is one of the cruelest things ever, right? Okay. Whole careers come down to those two equations, okay? And the career I'm talking about is civil engineering. These are the equations that define civil engineering, right? <laughs> so that doesn't even begin to tell the story of the horror that is chapter 12, right? So what might you want to include beyond that? <laughs> Yeah, a picture, right? I would have, I would just, I, for me, it was always just two pictures, right? Okay, it was the horizontal sign, okay, um, and on that picture, right, just drawing in the forces, right, of what's going on. There's, there's lots of variations on a theme here that, that, that can happen, like, you know, this wire may not connect to the end. It might connect to another part. There could be, let's see, was it your homework that had a, had a bear in it? No. Was there a person walking along a beam at some point? It's like a box. Yeah. Or a box that was on the, yeah. Sometimes books have like a bear that wants to get to a basket of honey or something on the thing. Right? But you can have people standing here, in which case you've got to like add, right? Um, that force that's acting but but overall right you need to make sure that you are defining an axis there's kind of a rule of thumb for where you want to put that axis to make the math easy where do you want to put the axis yeah the greatest point of point where you have the greatest number of unknown forces and uh, again these forces you're going to want to break down you, I mean, almost always in a, what I call the sine or the horizontal bar problem, you're breaking up the forces and your x and y axes are perfectly vertical and perfectly horizontal, right? We don't, we don't rotate coordinates for this one, okay? Um, and your choice of which direction is positive for torque doesn't, well, just stay consistent. Unique and different is the latter problem. This is the one where you tear your hair out all the time, right? Okay. But the latter problem consists of forces that aren't acting perpendicular to anything, <laughs> right? Okay. The distances we draw along the ladder, right, are not perpendicular to these forces. And again, there can be forces all over the place. Again, different variations on a theme here with how high a person might be on the ladder. Um, uh, did you have the problem where the person was holding like a beam up and it was exerting a force pushing out? Okay, so there's all kinds of different ways to, to do the same thing, okay? Um, and perhaps extra, so in terms of forces here, again, generally we just use the standard vertical and horizontal coordinate system, okay? You can tilt the coordinates that you want, but don't, don't tilt these forces because all these forces are already naturally perfectly horizontal and perfectly vertical. Where, where the, these kinds of problems begin to fall apart time and time again in student work that I've seen over the years is, is torque, right? Torque for the sign can be an issue. 
Torque for the ladder, definitely an issue. So you want to spend some time reviewing this and really trying to make sure you've got a method to get through those torques. But we confuse you, we, I say we, I mean engineers, um, but the universe in general confuses us because there's two ways that we can go about finding a torque. And we can either find perpendicular components of force, or we can use the perpendicular distance to the line of action of the force. The second one is more powerful, but can take a little while to learn. So you might just want on your cheat sheet to sort of have maybe both described somehow, right? Here's my line of action, and so this is my distance right here, L over 2 cos. Again, just not as a, a way to like make an exact copy of the problem, but, but to work as a, like a template to guide you in your thought process. And then maybe have another one of these be the, the component, right? Where the angle theta right there, and so this is going to be whatever that force is, cosine theta, right? Just again, to give you a reference, right? When you're solving the problem. Um, you can, well, this is either a warning, a threat, or something to make you smile depending on how you want to take it, okay? But I did, so you may have, I don't know, maybe you noticed that the homework in chapter 12 took a while, right? The problems are just kind of crunchy. Even, even after you get them set up, there's like this horrible algebra jungle that you have to wade through to even get the answer. I'm less interested in you showing me your algebra skills than I am in you showing me your physics skills. Some of you I know prefer it to be the other way around. I've deliberately engineered the problems to be quick to solve mathematically. Right? So like the setup still needs to be there, but I've like given you sort of excess information. So instead of having four equations with four unknowns, right? You might it all boils down to like there's only two unknown things. Two equations, two unknowns, boom, boom, and it's done, right? So like like I have these tricks so that on a on a timed exam where you only get 120 minutes. And quite frankly, any one of these equilibrium problems is easily a 20 minute problem, right? <laughs> okay. So not only have I sort of engineered the problem to most of it's set up, as you know, I, I really kind of give you credit if it's set up correctly, even if the sort of the math falls apart later, I, I want to give you credit. I've engineered it so that the math goes quick. Okay. Um, but you still need to get the setup done. The flip side of that is understanding that there are two equilibrium problems on there that could be a time sink for you, right? My intent is for other problems on the exam to be quick. That backfires sometimes because you come up, Mr. Bill, this is the longest one I worked on. I'm like, that was the one that's supposed to take you like two minutes, right? <laughs> okay. You overthought it or something like that, which is, which is fine. It happens all the time, right? But I, I am actively I actively attempt to balance the time. So as you're sitting down and you're starting the exam, you're going to really, if you haven't done it before, do it on this exam. Sit down, identify which ones of the two equilibrium problems, save them to the end. Like seriously, get rid, get through everything else first, right? Okay, because you don't want to spend half of your test time on one problem and realize you only have an hour left to do 11 more problems, right? So just, just push those off to the side. I know you're like, I'm fresh, I'm, I'm into it, I can think real fast, I can get the, use that power to get most of the other parts of the exam out of the way, right? And then come back and do that. Uh, do those equilibrium problems. But yeah, I mean, does anybody else have any ideas or, or suggestions on what to put down for like the cheat sheet for chapter 12? It's a method, right? More than it is a set of equations. Maybe write down the method, right? Write down, okay, step one, I've got to draw my free body diagram. I've got to make sure I can name object. Step number two, I've got to identify torques. And I've got the little pencil trick, right? Um, thankfully, there won't be any like right-hand rule, like give me the direction of the torque. I'm not asking about that, right? Equilibrium does direction just in clockwise, counterclockwise, so, right? Uh, but yeah, having having a list of steps to follow that always helped me, right? As I was sitting there freaking out, my brain blanks. I can look at my set of steps and go, oh, yeah, I've done this before. I can do it again. So, uh, 
All right. Well, okay. Chapter thirteen. Oh my gosh. Here's where here, here here's the here's where the uh, toolbox becomes overwhelming, right? And there's often too many things to pick from. Uh, in chapter thirteen, I would I think I would maybe divide this up, right? Because again, there are equations that apply when it comes to gravitation that apply always. It doesn't matter if something's in orbit or not. And then there's equations that apply for orbits. And I'm, I, I'm probably not going to remember all of them. I'm not even looking at my notes here. But in terms of the ones that apply always, you have the law of gravity, right? Okay. And in its fullness with its vectorness, right, that negative sign just reminds us that it points inwards, right? Talking about the magnitude of the force of gravity, just take the r hat off, take the minus sign off, just do the numbers, right? Um, do you need to write big G down on your sheet? Of course not. You probably already know it. You've used it so much, right? 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, right? But I'll have it for you on the exam. What is that r in that denominator? Where is it measured from and to? Yeah, it's always center, right? It's always that center distance. But when you're given an altitude, it's always measured from the surface of something, isn't it? So you got to be careful about altitude or radius, distance from center. Uh, another one that is, uh, doesn't depend on an orbit was our result for finding little g, right? Um, anywhere. Okay, it doesn't have to be in orbit, just wherever it is, distance from center planet, and we got it. Um, and then to bring everything together, we also defined a gravitational potential energy. Um, and this one, okay, where is the gravitational potential energy zero? <laughs> it's the furthest point away. It is not at the surface of a planet. <laughs> this is where everybody wants to put it. Okay, because we've trained, I've trained you well. Lowest point in the problem. What this is the one time you were not allowed to do that. Okay, and so make sure that if you're on the surface of a planet, you are calculating a gravitational potential energy, and then if you go up to anywhere else, it will have a different potential energy. One of those is not zero unless you are actually getting to infinitely far away, like effectively leaving the planet's gravitational field. Um, is there anything else that was just sort of applied everywhere, but not for an orbit? Oh, uh, escape speed. Uh, is it, uh, darn, is it GM over R? Or is it 2GM over R? There's always a 2. 2 that haunts me in, in orbital mechanics. I think that's it. It is? 50 50 chance. And today I won. Okay? So again, the escape speed does not, doesn't care if you're in orbit or not. It's just the speed that you need in order to leave the planet behind. Right? Okay. So over to the to the orbital side, right? Okay. So these equations only apply when something's in orbit. Kepler's third law, uh, 4 pi squared over g m r cubed, okay? Uh, that is definitely something that we need. I actually got to get my uh, notes out for this one because... Uh, what? For the escape speed? For what? I have escape speed is 2 gm over r. There is another. We're going to get to the orbital velocity. So, so, so then there's, okay, so the orbital speed for any object that's in orbit, I mean, clearly and not confusingly, is gm over r. <laughs> this is rocket science, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, so this is like what I mean, like, Part of being successful in chapter 13 is being careful about 
knowing which equations apply in which situations, right? So that can, that can be a challenge. Uh, but yeah, I just, I, just looked, I just found my page with the orbital speed equation. Um, there, there are some other things in here, like uh, the period of an orbit, 2 pi r over the speed. That's not a new chapter three, uh, 13 equation. That came out of our circular mechanics. We've been, we've been using that one sort of over and over again. Um, then there was orbital energy. So um, you can write the kinetic energy of something in mm -hmm. orbit as GMM over 2R. So that would be just the kinetic energy of a satellite in an orbit. You can then write the total orbital energy as negative GMM over 2R because that's not confusing at all. What's the difference between those two equations? That's a negative sign, right? Okay. So <laughs> again, know what they're asking for. I think in one of your homework problems, they did ask for like, what's the kinetic energy? Or maybe they gave you a kinetic energy or something, right? They're very specifically asking you or telling you about kinetic energy. Whereas if all you need to know is the total energy it has in its orbit. And why, why am I stressing total? What is it a combination of? Potential and kinetic. The potential being negative GMM over R. The kinetic being GMM over 2R. Put those together, you get negative GMM over 2R. Right? So that's, that's a total. Right? And of course, you can still write kinetic energy as 1 half mv squared. But then you have to put in the orbital v. When you do that, you end up with GMM over 2R. Right? It's all, it's, they're all consistent, right? Really, truly, I wish I could tell you that I was making this up, right? Because then it wouldn't matter. It'd be like philosophy, right? You've got, <laughs> right? Okay. But I'm not making this up, right? I mean, human beings have created the construct of mathematics and algebra and, and ways to think about it, right? But, but the universe tells us what these laws are. We just, we give them form in a language that we can understand. And just so whether we're talking about in terms of math or concept or colors or whatever, right, these relationships are still the same. So yeah, don't blame me. Don't shoot the messenger. What's the key to writing for two? Two pi r over v. Yeah. Uh, the orbital period is equal to the orbital circumference divided by the orbital speed. Yeah, again, that, that was straight out of circular motion. Um, you know, it, centripetal acceleration, because it's in orbit going around a circle, v squared over r still applies. You can throw that on there if you want, but I think these are, am I forgetting anything? No. Because once you have Kepler's law, honestly, and, and the total orbital energy, you can go anywhere. You can do anything. Um, when you're calculating trajectories through the solar system, um, for real z's, you do have to worry about other inputs of energy and things like that. And that's where differential equations start, start happening. But unless you go work for NASA, that's not, not something you've got to worry about. All right, I think that was chapter, anything else in chapter 13, like for, for, for a um, for a cheat sheet, for a summary sheet? Oh, maybe write down Kepler's laws, right, first and second. I mean, we got the third law down there, right? Uh, but, you know, Kepler's, Kepler's first law was um, uh, elliptical orbits. And the second law was um, we call it equal area and equal time, but it's really conservation of energy. And so you might want to just have like a picture, like a true one, like where 
the sun's here, and uh, maybe the maybe the Earth's right there in its orbit, and um, you know if it's orbiting around this way. What is what is the Earth doing at this point? Is it speeding up or slowing down in its orbit? It's speeding, it's speeding up because it's 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 falling. It's getting closer to the sun, right? Uh, what's that? Equal area and equal time. What you can't read, Mr. Bailiff? It is. I'm sorry. Try that better. I deserve that. My handwriting is terrible. I had no hope for my son. His right handwriting is even worse than mine. And then he went to college and he realized he couldn't read his own notes. <laughs> and so his handwriting got better. Uh, all right. Uh, Kepler's laws, orbital mechanics. Pretty much it. There's some weirdness with orbital mechanics that flow from this. Like, if you want to go faster in an orbit, which way do you go? Go inwards, right? Because you got Your orbital speed depends on your radius. Um, you can't change big G. You can't change the mass of the planet. But what you can change is where you are. So, all right. Uh, and then fluids. Is this helping you at all? This kind of summary and yeah, some of you have given up hope. Uh, chapter 14. Uh, okay, chapter 14. Lot, so, so three major like subsections of chapter 14. There was pressure, there was Archimedes' principle, and then there was Bernoulli's equation. Okay? Um, the first two are fluid statics. The last one's fluid dynamics. So for pressure, it was this equation that told us, among other things, that pressure only depends on depth. And where is depth in this equation? It's the H, the height of the column of fluid, right? Doesn't matter, the, the shape of the container doesn't matter. Um, how much fluid is in the container doesn't matter. It's only the vertical height above the surface. And then what is the, the P naught, the piece of zero? It, it's whatever the ambient pressure is that the fluid is sitting in. So typically, you got like water in a pool, right? And if you want to find the actual pressure two meters below the surface, not only do you get pressure from the fluid, the rho GH, but you also have pressure that's pushing down from the air on top of it, right? So that. And then there's, um, confusingly, there's this thing called the gauge pressure. Pressure gauges always measure a difference in pressure. So if your tire, if the pressure gauge on your tire reads zero, is there a true vacuum inside of your tire? Like, have you evacuated all of the fluid air out of your tire? No. When the gauge reads zero, what is it trying to tell you? Inside and outside are equal. So this, so a gauge always reads a, it's a comparison, right? Between what the thing is you're measuring and the ambient pressure, right? So when, so when, when, um, when your car manufacturer says that it needs 35 PSI, pounds per square inch in the tire, what's the actual true pressure in that tire? 49.7, isn't it? What did I just do? It's 35 on the gauge plus the 14.7, right, that it started with. That, when the gauge read zero, 14.7 inside, 14.7 outside, and now you've added an additional other. So the actual pressure, what physicists call the absolute pressure, would be 49.7. Am I adding that right? 35 plus 14.7? 39.7, right? So you have to add, you know, that, that P naught, right? It often gets forgotten, <laughs> right? You'll be, you'll be so excited to calculate what the pressure is at some depth, you'll forget to add on the atmospheric pressure or whatever on top. 
Uh, pressure units can be a little bit confusing. What is the safe unit to always be working in? Pascals. Okay. All of these equations are dimensionally consistent for SI units. That's a big long sentence that means use SI units whenever you're in doubt. So we knowing that atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, what do you do with that number? Convert it to 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. And again, I'll give you the conversion factors, but you need to remember you can't just add an atmosphere to some. What are the units of rho GH? I mean, rho is a density, so that's a kilogram per cubic meter. G is meters per second squared, and H is a meter. Believe it or not, you put all those together, you get a Pascal. It's just baked in, right, to how we put all of this stuff together. If that's a Pascal, you can't take an atmosphere and add a Pascal. Like, I know they're the same, they're pressure units, but they are different units. And so you've got to convert one or the other, okay? Get into, get into the same thing, right? So just, just be careful, right, with your unit conversions. Uh, let's see. And so uh, that was pressure. It wasn't really, I mean, there weren't any other equations for pressure. I mean, there was, there was um, Pascal's principle, the hydraulic principle, but that really just said that for a closed container, right, pressures are equal, so you can take your forces... And what does a hydraulic do? It, what does it increase? The force that you can exert, right? Okay, um, by playing around with the cross-sectional areas inside of a hydraulic system. Uh, let's see. Then there was Archimedes, the um, revenge of Chapter Twelve, the revenge of equilibrium, right? But only this time it was for fluids. So anything that's in a fluid is going to experience this buoyant force, right? And then there's going to be other things, the weight of the object itself, uh, the number of kids, the number of logs, whether or not there's an antenna, whatever, right? That you might have in the problem, okay? That's acting downwards or even upwards, okay? But in the end, you're trying to get back to, if something is floating, the net force on it will be zero, right? And so then it becomes the chore of working through those equilibrium problems, but now knowing that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of what? Is it the weight of the object? If the object is floating, the buoyant force and the weight of the object will be the same. But you can't say that all the time. What can you say about the buoyant force? It's the weight of the displaced fluid. So even for something that's sinking, the buoyant force is still the weight of the displaced fluid. Did I tell you about my kids playing with rocks in the river, in the mountain? My kids, the, the, like back when they're in diapers, it's kind of hilarious to watch a kid try to swim in a diaper um, because uh, the diaper just fills with water and then water logs the kid, right? Okay. But um, they would play on the edge of the creek or whatever in the mountains, and they, they discovered that if they picked up a rock underwater, they could like pick it up. It was, it was lighter, but as soon as they tried to get the rock out of the water, they'd fall over, right? Because like suddenly it got heavier. And, and don't call. Um, I would love to sit there and watch my kids, right? Because they, they would try to lift these rocks and they're like lifting, oh, look at me, daddy, right? And they lift it out of the water enough that the buoyant force is no longer acting on it and it, they would then tip over, right? And then so you see kid, boom, right? You just start drowning in the water, right? And legs sticking up out of the water with their hands underneath the rock. You have to go in and pull your kid out of the water, right? So why does the rock feel lighter under the water? There's buoyant force, right? Now, is there buoyant force on that rock when you lift it into the air? Yes! There is a displacement of air. But key difference between air and water? <laughs> One of them you can breathe. 
One of them is very dense compared to the other, right? Air, not very dense. Water, very dense, right? And so we feel that buoyant force directly, right? You feel the buoyant force on you when you're swimming. Okay? Lifts you up, okay? So remembering that this buoyant force depends on the fluid, density of fluid displaced, and volume of fluid displaced. You can then make, depending on the problem, right, if 80% of the iceberg is below the surface of the ocean, right, then how much water is being pushed out of the way? Point 0.8 times the volume of the iceberg, right? Uh, let's see, was there anything else in, uh, well, and then we, we derived the thing that we already knew already. What does the density of an object need to be in order for it to float? It has to be less than the density of the fluid it's in, right? So right now I know that the density of you is more than the density of air. How do I know that? You're sinking. You're sinking in air right now, right? If you jumped, you would not be lifted up, okay? Right? So what is the density of an aircraft carrier? What does it have to be? Not, not the air. You're thinking Marvel and the Avengers and the helicarrier. Which, by the way, if you do the calculation, it's impossible even for Tony Stark to lift that thing. Anyway, this is what I do on my free time. Um, pr prove comic book movies wrong. Mythbusters made a career out of it. Why can't I? What do we know about aircraft carriers if they're floating on the surface of the ocean? Their density has to be less than water, which is mind-blowing, right? It's made of nuclear power plants and fighter planes and ammunition and people and uh, was it three bowling alleys and five galleys and two movie theaters? Like they're floating cities, okay? The average density of an aircraft carrier is less than water. As a matter of fact, because only one fifth of an aircraft carrier is below the surface of the ocean, I can tell you exactly what the density is, is one fifth out of seawater, okay? Just don't let the air out, right? Let the air out, then all you're displacing is like the metal and concrete and the asphalt and the uranium and everything else that they put. So, uh, plutonium actually. Anyway, uh, let's see. I think. Is there anything else with Archimedes principles? I don't think so. And then there was Bernoulli. Again, this, this is really statics over here, and this is dynamics or fluids in motion, right? And it's that master equation that really drives everything. Um, what are the units of every single term in this equation? What are the units of P? Pascals, what are the units of 1 half rho v squared? Pascals, what are the rho, units of rho g8? They're all pressure units, right? They're all Pascals. But when we do our problem solving, when we actually attack problems involving fluids in motion, what's the conceptual framework that we work under? What kind of problem is it? where we do an initial and a final and a zero. And it's conservation, right? Conservation of energy. So you, you approach it with that, I want to say old, familiar, maybe not, maybe not for you, maybe it still terrifies you or something, right? Okay? But it's still, it's that conservation of energy approach that we've done over and over and over again. So, I don't know, maybe have a, a picture, right? of a thicker to a thinner pipe where there's one height there 
and there's another height there, and maybe you call that one zero, and then this has a, a V1, and this has a V2, and this has an area one and an area two, because equation of continuity holds, right? And then maybe a reminder that this is one and this is two, and so on and so forth, right? Whatever visual anchor that you need. Um, you know, this, this cheat sheet's supposed to be this, this familiar friend, right, on the exam that you can turn to when you're lost or confused and you can't quite remember. So what you're trying to do is anticipate, right? You've done your homework, you've been here in lecture, you know the parts where you've just always been confused or clocked out on or whatever, right? Get those things down on a cheat sheet. Really start working on that. And so Wednesday, you can come to me and say, Mr. Bale, I'm still not, I'm still fuzzy on this. Right? And you'll have it there to, to remind you. Okay? You can't put everything on the cheat sheet. Put the things where you know that you are kind of weak or that you need a reminder so that you'll have it right there during the exam. You can look at it. Oh, yes, that's right. This is something I've got to think about. That, that's its purpose. Um, oh, yeah. All is lost. Guess that. Think. That's a wrap for me. <laughs> On Wednesday, you'll come with your questions. And then, oh, when do we come together for the, for the vinyl, the exam autopsy? Is it Wednesday for you guys? The, um, the finals, did I, yeah, the final exam schedule is always very weird how they format this thing, okay? But, um, it, yeah, it's this big wall of text, right? So we meet at 8 o'clock a.m. And we are in the A category because we are a Monday, Wednesday class, okay? So Monday, Wednesday, we're in the A group, right? And so that means we meet Wednesday, May 17th, Wednesday. So which room are you coming to? This room. I know I've taught you test autopsies always happen in the other room, right? You're going to come to this room, and there's going to be two groups in this room, right? The 8 a.m. and the 11 a.m., you have to find somebody that did the exam with you, right? Okay? Because you can't, it's hard to do an exam autopsy when you're working off two different exams. Right? Okay? But you'll have to come next Wednesday. So we meet on Wednesday. Thursday, you take the exam. And then we do not meet until next Wednesday, right? We do not meet Monday or Thursday of finals week. It's only that Wednesday. What else are you going to turn in? Your quizzes. Anything else you may have. Have a great rest of the day. I'll see you Wednesday.